I just wanted to also introduce very quickly our uh, panelists uh, for our resiliency and environment uh, panel. And uh, I'm going to start with Liz uh, from NYPERG. And Liz, will you introduce yourself and say hello? And then also make sure that um, you know we talk a little bit about um, you know our environmental uh, issues that were covered and not covered in our budget. And so um, just a couple of district specific issues. Um, we know that right now here in lower Manhattan, um, climate change remains a huge priority. No doubt that we're, there's going to be another severe weather event like Superstorm Sandy down here. The question is really about when it will happen. And I just wanted to uh, note that, you know, uh, lower Manhattan has had uh, several discussions about <laughs> um, what we can do for resiliency, but right now in the time of COVID, the, a lot of things have been on pause. So I um, wanted to kind of uh, hit up Liz and Kate on uh, both of these issues, but Liz, will you start? Thank you. Sure, thank you so much, Assemblymember, for having me at this event. Um, it's an honor to get to speak to you guys today. I love getting to speak with constituents. Um, so my name is Liz Moran. I'm the Environmental Policy Director for NYPERG, the New York Public Interest Research Group. Um, and this was a really tough budget, but it's during that for the environment, there were a lot of positives in this year's budget. Um, so the Assembly member made some really important points about uh, the importance of fighting the climate crisis and making sure that New York City is resilient to the next Superstorm event. Um, and there's so much that we need to be doing. I think it's also important to note that uh, the COVID crisis has really highlighted the importance of investing in our environment and having strong environmental protections. Um, for example, a lot of people more than ever are seeking the outdoors as a refuge in this time of crisis and space has become so valuable. We've seen a number of viral images from New York City where people are just crowding parks and it's really unfortunate. Um, so it shows just how important having access to green space truly is. Um, not only that, a number of images have gone viral from other parts of the country and world about how much cleaner the environment is right now. Um, there are images from uh, Los Angeles uh, of clean air that isn't covered with smog. Uh, images from different cities in China that have cleaner skylines in India with cleaner skylines. Um, there were images that went viral from Venice, Italy with the canalways being perfectly clean. So people really appreciate a clean environment. and. It shouldn't take people having to be stuck in their homes for our environment to be clean. It's not individual's fault that our environment is in the condition it is. This, these are uh, systemic issues that need to be addressed globally by our governments. Um, and not only that, because we have legacy pollution in this country, uh, because uh, there are communities that have been adversely impacted by air pollution, uh, by water pollution. Uh, those are the same communities that are adversely impacted by, the, um, by COVID-19 right now. There was a study that was released from Harvard that found that people who live in communities with worse air pollution uh, are more likely to die from COVID-19. Um, so this is a crisis that's truly highlighted why as a country, we need to be doing more to protect our environment. Um, but unfortunately, it's been left to the states. Our federal government has not just dropped the ball, that's putting it kindly at this point. Um, our federal government is actively harming public health and actively harming the environment and the decisions it made before the COVID-19 crisis and continues to make just in the course of this pandemic. Um, the federal administration has rolled back more regulations. Uh, they've weakened fuel emission standards. They have put forward a rulemaking that largely eliminates a number of Clean Water Act protections for streams and wetlands. Um, and on top of that, they have a blanket policy to effectively not enforce environmental laws and regulations during the course of this pandemic. So uh, well-endowed polluters, the fossil fuel industry, the plastics industry, have taken total advantage 
of this crisis. Uh, to advocate for further rollbacks, a number of states are enforcing a lot of plastics uh, laws and regulations. Um, and the fossil fuel industry and the plastics industry actually might soon enjoy a massive bailout. While we just heard <laughs> in the previous panel, we have millions that can't afford to pay rent. Uh, so in the face of that, New York State has done a lot of things uh, in the state budget that are positive and serve as a good balance to what's going on federally. There's a lot more we need to do, but we're in a good place. Um, so some of them are, I don't know how much you want me to keep going or if we should go to another panelist, but I could certainly outline much more <laughs> of the budget if you'd like. Yeah, that would be great. Um, let's let's uh, let Kate talk for a little bit, but just because you mentioned it, um, I, I just wanted to touch base and let people know that some of the biggest highlights were um, on the ban on polystyrene, styrofoam, uh, food containers, um, and uh, the uh, big, uh, obviously huge bond that we are trying to put together for the Restore Mother Nature Act. It's $3 billion, but it's not nearly big enough as, we know, as we've been talking about, Liz, right? And um, it is dedicated towards climate change mitigation, environmental restoration, and conservation and resiliency infrastructure. And I just want to say why it's not big enough, because just here in Lower Manhattan, our needs alone are around $8 billion. So just, just so folks understand how much smaller it is in the in the conversation of the um, of the dollars, because even though it says three billion, it sounds really big to us who can't pay rent, like me, um, I, I just want to say that it is um, actually not even enough for Lower Manhattan. So just, just to put it out there. Um, I wanted to also put uh, out there that uh, the budget also keeps the funding level for Environmental Protection Fund, um, the EPF, consistent at $300 million, um, and, and that these are obviously steps in the right direction, but we, we need to find um, alternative sources of capital uh, to ensure that our preservation initiatives are adequately funded. So those are just a couple of things that we touched base at the beginning of our program, but I wanted to bring it back here. And I know that you have so much more that you can add, Liz, because um, you're an expert. And I will um, uh, get back to you right after Kate introduces herself and then also um, some of the work that the Waterfront Alliance is doing. And then we have a couple of questions that um, were submitted in uh, into our inbox and so wanted to kind of touch base on those before we um, kind of uh, launch into some of the things that we want to see down here, okay? Uh Hello, uh, thanks, so, can you hear me? All right, thank you so much for having me to the assembly member and thank you to all the elected officials and all of the participants that are showing up today on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I'll just briefly touch on who we are, uh, just a, touching on the, the budget as the assembly member just highlighted, uh, we completely agree. Um, and just briefly what we can do at the state level and, and a little bit of a highlight on federal. Um, so the Waterfront Alliance is an alliance of more than 1100 alliance partners. We work on making sure our waterfronts are accessible to all, that they are resilient and that they are vitalized and for generations to come. Um, I think we've heard a lot of pretty uh, pretty tough stats today, so just very stay light on those. But uh, we have more than one million people in the floodplain today in our region. We had a NYCHA resident that highlighted uh, her risk about COVID. We have 17% of NYCHA housing actually in the floodplain today. Um, so these are some things that we're concerned about as an organization. Um, last year we developed a policy paper that we have been organizing around to build a coalition and campaign called Rise to Resilience. I want to acknowledge my colleague Trevor Holland, who leads uh, Tough LAS, Tenants United Fighting for Lower East Side. He probably knows more about the East Side Coast Resiliency and Two Bridges projects than I do. So if you have a question, definitely ask him too. Um, so these are pretty tough issues. We need action at federal, state, and local levels. Um, one thing is the Bond Act. We got $3 billion, the first one since 96. Um, so it's great and we need to vote on it. And that's just a reminder that it's something that we vote on and it's effectively raising the debt ceiling. So uh, that's something we have to kind of keep going on. Um, the, the second piece of that is... That vote, Kate. Sure. Sorry? When is that vote? When is the vote? Um, uh, that's in November. Thank you. Um, on the November ballot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just to make clear, it's not a not a preliminary measure, but a, a November ballot measure. Um, so we also um, 
the other piece of this is we need a long-term funding source. We have a surcharge on your electricity bill that goes to fund NYSERDA. Uh, that's something we don't have for flooding at all. There's nothing that goes towards a long-term flooding fund. Uh, we'd love to see that and, and it's, it's critical. It's essentially a, a utility we're not managing. Um, we also kind of need a statewide framework for climate resilience. We don't really have that. I think that was the intention of the Climate Risk, uh, Community Risk and Resiliency Act of 2014. Uh, but a lot of the things that we're committed to in, in that act have not really uh, been realized. And there's not really any large changes on land use rules and, and how the state guides that. Um, we also have talked to one of the senators, I believe that was uh, previously on here, about uh, right to know uh, our flood risk disclosure. That's something that you can kind of waive your right to know with $500. That's wrong, and that's something we'd like to fix. Um, we'd also like to bid, build bridges, increasing uh, what we see on COVID. We have New York State working with New Jersey, working with Connecticut. We're stronger together in the federal, in the federal sphere uh, to get things like a federal stimulus where we're investing in NYCHA, where we're investing through HUD, through uh, green stimulus and green jobs. Um, so those are some of the things, just a sampling of what we're fighting for, but we look forward to, to fighting with the assembly member and all of you um, and happy to chat and take questions. All right, well, it's a good thing you mentioned Trevor being an expert and asking questions to Trevor because Trevor's got a question for you um, <laughs> for the panel. Um, so Trevor's question is, how do we continue to advocate for resiliency projects in our neighborhood in the face of ranking priorities and massive budget cuts? And this is a very valid question. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of uh, two things, we're investing at the federal level in recovery dollars right now. We need them first and foremost to go to those that were hit first and worst. Um, and I think that that's um, complicated when you think about the multiple risks people in the floodplain, people in NYCHA housing in the floodplain face right now. Um, so I think we can do two birds, one stone with federal dollars and think about how we can both recover and invest in job recovery uh, that also is, is infrastructure development. Infrastructure is green jobs. Um, I think that that could be mimicked at the state level. Um, so there's, there's some of that. Um, and there's also, I think we're not really thinking long term. We generally pass budgets year to year without developing a long term funding source that incrementally builds. And that's why I think we keep coming back to looking at things like a surcharge on insurance, which is progressive, long term funding source for resiliency. Um, and it, you know, it's not going to happen tomorrow for sure, um, but it's something that we can start building on now. Amazing. Um, all right, so one other question. I'm going to also allow Liz to kind of talk a little bit. This is actually kind of wrapping into what she was talking about before um, about the state budget. But who is in charge of distributing the funds allocated for certain projects in the environment right now? And what is the current plan at the state level for these kinds of disasters? So, Liz? I know it's kind of large. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best to answer that because it's going to vary depending on the type of project, um, what fund it's coming out of, but primarily the agencies that are going to be funding these sort of projects um, would be uh, DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, but it could also be, depending on the type of project, uh, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, um, or if it's a water infrastructure project, it actually could from, come from um, the Environmental Facilities Corporation, EFC. Um, and that's another resiliency piece, a uh, part of the Mother Nature, uh, the Restore Mother Nature Bond Act um, is investing in, in water infrastructure, um, which in New York City uh, certainly needs uh, increased resiliency as well. Uh, combined sewer overflows are a big issue for the city. Um, and that's uh, part of the Restore Mother Nature Bond Act, and we also do have the Clean Water Infrastructure Act, which funds a number of water projects in the state. Last year on, in our budget, and that was Steve Engelbright's baby. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a really important measure. Um, Assembly member, you made a great point that needs are tremendous. The needs of your district alone could eat, eat up the three billion uh, Restore Mother Nature Bond Act. That doesn't come as a shock. Um, water infrastructure needs statewide alone uh, could cost as much as $4 billion annually to meet a 20-year need. 
Uh, so yeah, we need to be investing a lot more. It's good that we're making these steps forward. Um, but it's, it's not enough. So I apologize. That was a little bit of a long answer to how do we fund these things? Who do we fund these things? But it depends. We have a lot of different pots of funding to dig into. Amazing. Thank you, Liz. Um, and this one is, uh, again, about the East River Park. Um, Harriet feels very strongly that the destruction of East River Park this fall should not begin while this pandemic is still raging. She says, we have lost so many neighbors and loved ones, and many of us are still sick and have lost income sources. It feels inappropriate, almost, to spend $1.1 billion of city money on the ESCR when there is a cheaper plan that was thrown out. Can that money be re reallocated to help people still and pay rent and put food on the table? Yeah, I can answer part of that question. I'm not sure if I can answer all. So uh, feel free, Liz, to jump in. Um, just in, I think most of the, the folks on this call probably know about the history here, but uh, this project that initiated through uh, actually an authorization from Congress after Sandy um, was one of a rebuild by design projects where there was a strong community process, lots of back and forth, two-way engagement. And there was a failure to communicate. Um, I think a lot of concerns on the city side adequately from the beginning that they knew were there. And at the last minute, the plan was sort of switched and it became a new plan. And I think it eroded a lot of trust, including probably Harriet's and many of the others that I know working on this project. Um, it's, it's pretty offensive to spend your time and to, to have that flip uh, or rug pulled out from under you. In terms of, um, I guess there's two things to focus on here. Um, you know, one, what have we learned from it? And two, what can we do now? I think in terms of what we learned from it, um, we know that we, we probably don't have a good process for planning for flood risk and resiliency. Um, I'd say that we're just very much in our nascency of, of figuring that out, but there are things that we can do to make sure we codify process uh, and, and good process practices in any kind of project like this. Um, we also need more interagency collaboration so that these, these, these sort of projects don't sort of get so far along with disagreements between agencies that are not resolved and then come up at the last minute. Um, I think, you know, we've also learned a little bit more about cost. Um, I think that there were some cost concerns from the beginning of the project that were not necessarily communicated, but were there and uh, really came at the last minute. Um, so I think there are a few things that we can do to kind of resolve that. Um, one is thinking about a comprehensive resilience strategy or plan for New York City. Um, and in terms of the funding piece, the federal funding is already allocated through a very specific um, avenue, and we can't really change that easily. In fact, we're in danger of not having it if we don't spend it as soon as possible or by 2022. Um, in terms of the city money, I, I, I really don't think it's likely. Um, you know, I think that, that others might have more information on that. Um, they would have to do a complete redesign uh, or go back to the original plan and design that. And in, in two years, I, they're already breaking ground. It's, it's, it's not feasible now, but I think we need to learn from it and, and, and really focus on what's next because there will be more of these. Thank you so, so much. Um, and one last question from uh, one of our uh, constituents is, um, you know, right now businesses are really affected, uh, especially uh, small businesses. What do you think um, the effect will be for the styrofoam ban and will restaurants, especially in Chinatown, be disproportionately affected given their reliance on styrofoam in the past? It's a great question. Um, so a couple things, the polystyrene ban won't go into effect until 2022. So it's not going to affect right away. So there's a little bit more time for small businesses to adjust. Um, the plastic bag ban went into effect pretty quick. But the other thing to note is um, New York City already has a polystyrene ban. Um, so New York City is already ahead of the game. In fact, that polystyrene ban has a specific carve out in the language that was passed in the budget. So New York City is going to get to keep their polystyrene ban, and that'll still continue to be in effect. Um, but that said, there also is a provision in um, 
the legislation that could allow for small businesses um, to have additional time, um, possible exemptions, but I think they would have to apply through DEC for that. Amazing, thanks Liz. And one last question that just popped up and this is gonna be the last one for our um, Resiliency and Environment panel. Um, Tommy, one of my very good friends is just asking, what happened to the interim flood protection study we were promised as part of ESCR approval in November and without it, community um, is vulnerable for more than six years. The independent consultant recommended it. Any um, thoughts on that, Kate? And uh, you know, because it's on the city level, I think that I'm gonna kind of defer to you on that a little bit. Yeah, um, well, I know that there are interim flood protection measures that are in some communities in um, lower Manhattan by the Brooklyn Bridge. But I'm wondering if Trevor, if I could phone a friend on this one, because I, I'm not sure um, what the status is of just the ones that are right in front of where the ESCR is supposed to be. Um, so I, I'm not sure if he's willing to comment, sorry to put you on the spot, but I, I do know of the ones that are in place in lower Manhattan. I'm just not sure how far that stretches north exactly. And to, to sort of just explain what they are, so these are these, they're called HESCO barriers. They're basically bags of sand that are in the shape of a cube and they lock together and they'll kind of deal with the sort of two to 10 year events, the smaller, um, more frequent flooding that we're more likely to face in the near term. Uh, they certainly won't deal with a sandy style, uh, uh, size event, but they will deal with a, a smaller event. And, um, and I just wanted to follow up on Tommy's question because I think it's so valuable. Like, where is the funding for that coming from? And does that take away from the funding towards um, actual permanent resiliency? Yeah, I, I don't, I think that, that that funding comes from the city itself. But again, that's a very specific uh, question that, um, you know, Trevor might know the answer to uh, if, if, he, if he has it. But if not, I'll, I'll try to get back to you and send it to the assembly member. Amazing. Thank you, Kate. And then, um, Tommy, uh, we have a couple of things that we had written up for uh, this specifically, so I will make sure to um, send, send you a note uh, personally. Um, also, we wanted to thank our panelists again for all of the work that you guys put into making sure that our environment is protected. And I also wanted to say thank you for um, being on our panel today, because without you, we obviously, um, you know, Obviously, we have a lot of advocacy needs here in Lower Manhattan when it comes to resiliency and the environment. And without you guys, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. So thank you, Kate, and thank you, Liz. And um, we're going to be moving to our healthcare panel, but um, hopefully, you know, you guys can stay on later and uh, answer any questions that folks have as we go. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and now we have our amazing health and hospital panel. And we wanted to, of course, um, uh, say hello to our amazing healthcare chair, Richard Gottfried, who's been our healthcare chair um, and my mentor for a really long time now. So uh, thank you, uh, Dick, for being here. Um, also, I wanted to say that we have Pauline Ferrante from the Office of External Affairs at DOHMH on the call. As, uh, she's on her phone, though, so um, I'm going to unmute her just uh, so that she can say a quick hello. Um, and then uh, we have Ding from uh, the Apache Community Health Center. Ding, are you still there? I don't see Ding anymore. Um, all right, I'm going to make Hello, sure. I'm here. Oh, there, there you are. There you How are. How are you? Hi. hi, hi. Um, and then uh, we uh, also have Rocky still on and uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, Rocky can answer some of the things on AARP's uh, perspective as well when it comes to seniors. Is that all right with you, Rocky? If I can. All right. Thank you, Rocky. All right. So, um, uh, Oh, and, and for the folks who um, were on the resiliency panel who might now be in the attendees, um, Sarah had another question on that. And we'll, we'll get back to anybody who has questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Our office will get back to you on anything that you ask. Um, just make sure that we uh, have your uh, number and your address uh, and you can uh, info at Yulene New is the place to send that. Again, that is I-N-F-O at Y-U-H-L-I-N-E-N-I-O-U dot O-R-G. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. Again, um, we are taking questions in our chat. We are also uh, joined on three different, um, you know, I guess 
platforms. My staff is trying to navigate all of them. So they've been, they've been put onto different platforms to help to answer questions. Uh, we're, we're also answering questions for folks um, at, at all times uh, as we go, but also um, we're going to be following up with those questions whenever people ask us anything. Um, I have a cheat sheet. I just wanted to let people know we have a cheat sheet. My staff will put that into our chat again. Um, every single uh, time we have our amazing town halls, uh, we have this great cheat sheet that I'm known for now. It's a, it's very, very simple uh, breakdown of our budget, which actually is very complicated, but um, we try to help to let folks know what's going on in our budget um, at any given moment. And um, I wanted to, again, say thank you to our panelists.